Welcome again to 1 Peter. We've come to chapter 4, and I want to read chapter 4, verses 1 to 6. Since, therefore, Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. But they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. This passage is part of the long story of Christians being questioned about their faith and the difficulty of living as a Christian person that Peter has been dealing with ever since chapter 3, verse 8. And it could be argued this will continue until the end of the book. But we need to grasp that each short passage like this has got connections with where we have been already, and we need to note that. Would you please uh, note with me verses 1 and 2, where he speaks of the sufferings of Jesus. Now, you know that he's mentioned the sufferings of Jesus before, for example, chapter 3, verse 18. But now he wants to tell us more about the sufferings of Jesus. And notice how he does it. He says, Christ suffered in the flesh. There again is the idea that the one who died on the cross is no less than the Christ, the Messiah. He suffered on the cross um, in the flesh. And as he develops that thought, he goes on to indicate that this death was a death to deal with sin. So Peter is saying to his readers, Christ's death is a death for sin, and you need to grasp that, arm yourselves. Uh, it means do it at once, um, do it personally, Get this into your head. Jesus died once and for all to deal with sin. And you need to grasp that if sin has been dealt with by Jesus' death, then that is the end of your life in sin. So Peter is saying a dramatic thing here. He's not talking so much about the forgiveness of sin, as what flows from that. And that is, because our sins are forgiven, our whole lives from this point on needs to be different. So life has been split in two, says Peter, in verse 2, so that from now on, time past was the time when you lived according to the desires of human beings, but from now on, because your life with sin has come to an end, you must live from now on according to the will of God. This doesn't mean, of course, that you'll never sin again, but it does mean that to have encountered the Lord Jesus and met him as the one who has died for us has brought us to the point where sin reign and sin as the dominant force in our lives has come to an end. 
This brings us to verses 3 and 4. He then reminds, so he's told us what Christian life is like. Then he introduces us to Gentile life um, in verses 3 and 4, particularly notice verse 3. Gentile life is confronting because the word that is translated sensuality means blatant, obvious, unashamed sensuality. And uh, it is blatant, it is wasteful, it is pointless. And in Peter's time, all through the area where his churches were founded, people did these things in honour of the pagan gods. The feasts in honour of pagan gods were drunken, uncontrolled, wasteful, blatantly sensual. This is the way Gentile people were living, and his readers used to live that way too. Notice verse 4 brings us to uh, an upshot of that, and it is, if with this respect, they are surprised. They can't get their head around the fact that you are different. They are surprised that you do not run with them. It's not join, as in the ESV, but the, the, the verb is run together with them. You don't do this anymore. You don't go with us to the festival. You don't get drunk. You don't live in debauchery. You don't love that old way of life in which you lived. You don't join with them, says Peter in verse 4, in the flood of pointless waste which their lives, which Gentile lives are all about and which your life was all about. You don't do that anymore. So notice they... In this version, it says, they malign you. They run you down. Peter is saying this because he wants his readers to grasp that he's told them to be always ready to give an answer to those who ask the reason, the logical, worked-out reason for the hope that they have in the Lord Jesus. Peter says, you really must do this to explain why you are different. When they are puzzled, they say, why are you different now? Why do you not come to the feasts? Um, why do you abstain from those things that you used to love with us? Peter is saying that that, that manner of life in people living that manner of life are the ones that are asking the reason for the hope within you. And it's important for you to be able to do so. So notice again, there's an idea that's connected to earlier in the passage. Um, you must be ready to explain why it is you are different. But the passage rolls on to verses 5 and 6 where the scene changes from Christians and Gentiles to the Day of Judgment. Because in verse 5, there is a judge who is already waiting to judge the living and the dead whenever the Day of, the judgment, of judgment comes. And in that day of judgment, says Peter, people are going to be judged in the flesh, judged as human beings. But, he says, it is also possible that some of the people who come to the day of judgment will live like God in the spirit. Obviously, Christians are going to be there. But I think this passage is there to say 
being ready to explain why you are different, why you have come to love things that you once despised and despised things that you once loved. Be ready because who knows by your speaking, giving an, a reason for your faith and by your consistent living, you may be the very means which brings people who at the moment are living a pointless Gentile life into the kingdom of God beyond the judgment, beyond the day of judgment, there may be people that you once knew to whom you once spoke who will be in the kingdom of heaven because of you. That must have been a great vision in the first century AD, but it's a vision that you and I need to have for our behaviour and our spoken witness where we too live among Gentiles who sometimes ask the reason for the hope that is within us. God grant that we may be found faithful to him as consistent Christian livers and as people who can give a clear reason for the hope that we have in Christ that has changed our lives. Amen.